tomorrow at Berean Baptist, I'm bringing a message uh, for the Christmas season out of a text in Mark chapter 10. It's not the typical text that we would normally uh, use for a Christmas message, but it, it's going to be, I think, special in a number of ways. Uh, tonight I want to read it to you. Those who happen to check my blog this evening or those who missed the service can uh, get the gist of what I'm going to share tomorrow uh, as a Christmas message to our Berean family. The Christmas season is a wonderful time of the year, and it's a time when we remember the coming of Christ and His birth at Bethlehem, and we, it's a time when we ponder why He came and what was the significance of His coming. There's a, an unusual story found in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. It begins in verse 32. Jesus is with His twelve disciples, and it says, Now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going before them, and they were amazed. And they followed, and they were afraid. Then he took the twelve aside and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. So he's on his way to Jerusalem with his twelve disciples. He stops along the way because he senses that they're fearful about what's, what lies ahead and what's coming. So he's going to tell them what is going to happen in the near future as they come to Jerusalem. And in Mark 10.33 he says, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed, to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. They will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him, and the third day he will rise again. Here Jesus gives them the, probably the greatest insight and the most wonderful message as he explains, I'm going to Jerusalem, and this is what's going to happen. I'll be betrayed, spat upon, scourged. I'll be turned over to the Gentiles, they'll, they'll crucify me, but I'll rise again. This was amazing knowledge. And immediately after saying these things, almost as if they were totally oblivious to what he just said, James and John come to him. These are the sons of Zebedee, and they said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Totally ignoring this momentous information that Jesus just gave them, they come to him, ignoring these great things that he just said, and they ask this unbelievable question. Master or teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? What a question that they would ask. Master, we want you to do for us whatever it is we ask. Can you imagine having the audacity, the boldness, the arrogance to ask such a thing from Christ? But then he, he condescends to their level and says, well, well, what is it that you want me to do? In verse 37, they said this, Grant us that we may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left, in your glory. Can you imagine anything more preposterous than that? That these two disciples, the sons of thunder, James and John, would have the nerve, the gall, to ask the Savior, just after he's told them these amazing things about his coming death and, and scourging and suffering and crucifixion and resurrection, totally ignoring that, they said, we want to sit with you, one on your left and one on your right, in your glory. What an arrogant, presumptuous, selfish, ambitious question and, and desire that they displayed. Well, Jesus said to them, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? The, the cup of the Master and the baptism of the Master is basically, it's, these are references to the suffering, to the carrying of the cross, to the humility that we, that we are called upon to bear if we're going to walk the Calvary road with Jesus. Every Christian, everyone who's, who's a child of God, they must drink of his cup. They must partake of his sufferings partake of his baptism. That means his humility, his cross-bearing, his suffering, uh, all these things are part of what we have to do if we're to walk the Calvary road with Christ. Jesus said, are you able to drink my cup? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? And they, again, with great arrogance, said, we are able. And Jesus said, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink, and you'll be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. He's letting them know that, yes, you're going to suffer. You're going to carry your cross. You're going to walk Calvary Road. And you're going to know what it is to be a servant, what it is to, to suffer, uh, to die to self, to walk in humility, to, to bear the reproach of Christ. That's what he's telling them here. 
Well, after the ten disciples heard that James and John had asked such an incredulous thing, it says in verse 41, when they, they heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. The other ten were displeased with, with these two disciples that asked such a, an un, un, uh, unbelievable request from the Lord Jesus. It reminds me that here are the twelve disciples. Uh, Jesus just gave them the greatest information that could possibly be given as he's relaying to them that the time is approaching that Jesus, the Son of God, is going to be betrayed, scourged, spat upon, crucified, buried, resurrected. These great gospel truths are shared with them, and it's, it goes right over their head. And ignoring that, James and John ask, we want to sit with you in your kingdom, one on your left, one on your right. Uh, they had this selfish ambition, this great pride. But the other ten, when they heard this, they were very displeased. And there was division and a rift between them. Jesus comes and he calls them together. He says, he knew that there was division here and there was envy and jealousy and strife amongst them. He says, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. He says, whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant and whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. Here Christ is giving us the greatest lesson about humility and service. The way to greatness in God's kingdom is not to have great positions and great honors, to have great recognition. It's not to uh, have great wealth or influence. The way to greatness in God's kingdom is by humble service to Christ and to his cause. It's when we humble ourselves, die to self, take up the cross, when we follow him, when we turn the other cheek, when we do these things and serve Christ with untired and unceasing devotion, then we become great in the eyes of God in his kingdom. When we get to heaven, some of the greatest people in glory will not necessarily be the, the ch pastors of the biggest churches or those who spoke to the greatest crowds or those who wrote the most books or had the greatest recognition or the greatest human honors. Some of the greatest people in heaven are going to be those humble, choice servants of God who with unceasing devotion to Christ humble themselves. They washed the, the, the feet of the disciples, and that's figurative speaking. They, they learned what it was to serve, to minister, to die to, to their own ambition, and they lived a life of selfless sacrifice in serving and ministering to others. Many of these unsung heroes in our churches and around the world who have literally given their lives in untiring and unceasing devotion to Christ, these will be some of the greatest people in heaven. But then Jesus comes to the great verse at all. He tells us why he came. He says, if you're going to be great in the kingdom, you must be the slave of all. You must be a servant. And then he says, for even so, the Son of Man came to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The Lord Jesus Christ came not, not necessarily to be served. He came to serve. He came to live the life we could not live. He came to obey the very law that he gave Moses at Mount Sinai. He came to satisfy the justice of God by paying our debt for our sinful life, by, by dying on the cross for our sins. He satisfied God's justice by obeying every law that God requires of man, and that he died in our place to satisfy the holiness of God and his justice. So by living our life and dying our death, Jesus is able to pay our debt in full to God and because of that, he's able to grant to us eternal life. Now, the Spirit of God comes and gives us the, the, the ability to repent, that is, to turn from sin and to put our faith in Christ. It's all a gracious gift by God, by free and sovereign grace. This great salvation is what Christmas is all about. Christ was born in Bethlehem. From that point, his journey, his focus, his intent was to Jerusalem. From Bethlehem, to Jerusalem, the Lord Jesus had his eyes set on one special point in time, one special moment. From the day he was